It's wonderful. I love those harmonies and that energy. Yes. And speaking of energy, and maybe harmonies, Jay Pryor, our speaker today. Yay! Yay! Good morning. Good morning. It's so nice to be with you. If you don't know me, my name is Jay Pryor, and I'm a lay member of this congregation. And my day job is that I'm an executive coach and consultant and speaker, and um, I am one of the most blessed human beings on the planet. So I live a life that is designed by me. I am a, I'm an entrepreneur because I love being an entrepreneur. I'm married to the love of my life and my best friend, and I have two beautiful children. And I have this gorgeous faith community that lifts me up all the time. So I'm a very blessed human being, and I always like to lead with that. Oops, excuse me. Um, so that uh, you know where I'm coming from foundationally. So I want to talk about uh, peace, obviously, is kind of the topic, given that we're in Advent. And I was a raised Catholic when I was a kid. And every year at Christmas, in our congregation, first of all, we were raised in a town of 500 people, and our church was the biggest building in the town, and, um, <laughs> and it was traditional as you grew up in this congregation that you would get to different ages, and at different ages you would have different roles at Christmas time. So there were very traditional things that we did every year. One of them is that we did, we made sandbags, for example, when you got to be in like junior high, almost high school so you would be in a high school kids would do the CYO they would put out the sandbags and they would take paper bags and they'd put we'd put sand in the bag and then we'd put a candle in them and we would light the pathway to the church so when you came to, to midnight mass which we always had midnight mass it would be really dark and you'd come up to the church and just be gorgeous right these beautiful and they were made, they were made of paper bags and sand but it was just this gorgeous you know welcoming like this is what is welcoming you when you were a little bit younger, part of your, um, in like, especially maybe sixth grade, and you were a girl, which I was, if you don't also know me, my story is that I was born female. I lived over uh, as, in woman skin, as like, I like to call it, until I was 35. Last year, I went off testosterone, so I now have my woman's butt back. Um, I bought this suit in my man body, and I put it on this morning. I was like, damn. Ah, so... You know, that's how it goes. Uh, but when I was a little girl, it was like the thing to be able to be old enough to be in the pageant where you got to wear white robes and you got to hold stars on your hands and you would dance the uh, you would dance to "Do We Hear What I Hear" and "Away in the Major," all the songs at the beginning of <laughs> of church, and it was just I mean every year right I was just saying you know as you got older it was like you got different roles to participate in church, so when Jessica and I got together both of us had been raised in very uh, traditional. Um, she was raised in Missouri Senate Lutheran, and I was raised a Catholic, and we were both raised very traditionally in very have traditional things we did. And having an Advent wreath was one of those things. And so when we first got together, we, and especially when we were having kids, and I think we did it before we had kids, we got our own Advent wreath. And one of the things I loved was that Unity sends us a booklet and walks us through Advent. And for me, that was very, um, it was almost healing a little bit, right? Because I wanted some tradition, right? I wanted some kind. I had a longing for that tradition. If you're raised Catholic, and I know many of you were, part of the pain of leaving the church is leaving those traditions, right? So leaving that stuff that you know, that you just, it's so in you that it's just rote, right? I could still probably say the Nicene Creed, you know, any day because I haven't memorized, right, from the time I was a little kid. And so, and then in addition to that, we read studies about the fact that um, kids who have traditions in their lives tend to be more successful, right? Tend to have um, a more grounded, rooted in, in family that have traditions. So one of the things that Jessica and I did as we got together was we started our own family traditions. One of those was Advent, and having the Advent wreath, and then we have the Advent booklet that I always send off for. We have them out in the hallway if you haven't gotten one. We're just asking for a dollar donation. And they'll walk you through every day of Advent. So last week, we celebrated faith. 
And it's interesting to me as I pay attention that faith always comes, for me anyway, right at the time when we are looking at our checkbooks and looking at what we need to spend for Christmas and looking at the travel for Christmas and feeling like, <laughs> you know, it's like, <laughs> Are we going to be able to do this, right? And then we light the faith candle, right? And I, every single time when we light the faith candle in the beginning of the week, I am fearful, right? I am not in faith. <laughs> I am in fear, right? How are we going to do this? What's going to happen? It's fearful. And so last year, I very distinctly remember that it was faith, that, that first day of faith that I was like, oh, God. And then, if I listen and I read and I practice what I know to do every week, by the time I get to this Sunday, I have a little peace. I have just enough peace, right? <laughs> because I've been doing my work. And last year, one of the things I loved is that one of the t sometimes our booklet, which it did last year, focused way more intensely on the metaphysical interpretation of the Christmas story. And they were talking about Mary. And when it came to faith, Mary was the symbol of faith and clarity and resilience. And I really related to that. In fact, I took those on as my words for this for this past year. Resilience, faith, clarity. Those are some of the things I really needed last year. And this year, as I picked up that book and I thought, oh, they're not talking about that this year. It's a totally different version of faith. But all throughout the week, I've been reading my booklet and getting more and more faithful. And then as we came up on this talk about peace, I wanted to get real with you about that because I know that as a human being, we come into this world and we just cannot expect a life that is just a constant, you know, all's good, it's all good. <laughs> now, if you've had that life, bless you. Oh my goodness, bless you, bless you, bless you, bless you. I have not had that life. <laughs> um, Today we're so we're becoming to be a culture that is really conscious of mental health and we're really conscious of our brain and some of the things that we do. When I was growing up that was not the case. In fact, we were just talking about it downstairs. When I was growing up, it was kind of taboo for people to admit they had mental health issues, and it was not okay for people to go away. We used to have a, in our town, there was a woman that would often go to the fifth floor, right? The fifth floor was a psychiatric unit. I didn't know that growing up. I just knew she went to the fifth floor, is what they would always talk about, this woman who would go to the fifth floor. Well, I ended up at the fifth floor when I was 18, and it was the best gift I've ever been given in my entire life. My first trauma, there's something we call ACEs scores today. If you're familiar with ACEs scores, a few people. Not a lot of you, though, so let me, exp let me explain this to you. Today, psychologists and people who deal in the mental health world look at what someone's ACE score is. And ACE stands for Adverse Childhood Experience. So if you have had a lot of ACEs in your life, you've had a lot of adverse childhood experiences, we know that you have more trauma to your brain, right? Because every time you've had an adverse childhood experience, it can cause trauma in your brain. And therefore, perhaps might keep you from experiencing peace over someone who has had less adverse childhood experiences. So as I was thinking about this talk, I was thinking about one of my first traumas was the death of my sister. So I was six years old, and I had a sister, excuse me, who was, uh, when I was born, I was born into a family who had a terminally ill child. So my sister was terminally ill um, from the age of eight until she died at the age of 17. Now she couldn't go to school. So she stayed home, and my mom worked full-time in the grocery store that was attached to our house. So when I was an infant and my mom needed to go into the store, she would give me to my sister, who was in bed, who was terminally ill. So for the first six years of my life, I was predominantly spent most of my time with this sister who was terminally ill. She's the one that taught me my ABCs, and she taught me how to tie my shoes, taught me how to ride a bike. Sorry. Sorry, don't matter how to bike. So she died when I was six. And the last time I remember seeing her, sorry, um, I was at my sixth year old birthday party. And 
she was, I remember overhearing a conversation, I have really good ears, and overhearing a conversation with my mom telling her that she looked tired and she should go lay down and rest. And my sister said, it's Janet's birthday. My girl name was Janet. It's Janet's birthday. I'm not going to go lay down. And the next thing I know, she's going to the hospital. And my sister went to the hospital a lot when I was little. She would start throwing up blood and get sent to the hospital. She would always come back within a couple of weeks. So I figured this is just normal, right? Like she's just going to go to the hospital and then she'll be back. Two weeks came and went. She didn't come back. 30 days later, she died. So being in my small brain, <laughs> that was my fault. It was my birthday, right? Now, when I was a little kid, we didn't talk to kids like we do now. We didn't understand that we needed to talk to children about these things. So basically, you know, we just didn't talk about it that lot in my family. Also, the great good alcoholic family we were from, we don't talk about anything. So we're not going to talk about that. <laughs> so I remember very distinctly a situation that happened the following year. That was in between, she died in between my kindergarten and first grade year. So I remember very distinctly being in, being in first grade. And at some point, and I don't even to this day could not tell you what it was, but I just turned around with a black crayon and started scribbling all over the back of my chair. And it was a plastic, a little plastic chair. And my first grade teacher was somebody who was pretty harsh. She used to pull us by our ears and make us stand with our nose in the chalkboard and things like that. But I remember her bringing my mom in to talk to me about this thing that I had done, where I had turned around and scribbled on the back of my chair. And I remember distinctly that what they asked me was, why did you do that? Now, my son Emmett will tell you that that's his least favorite question, is why, right? Why do you do that? And I understand that because I didn't have an answer for that. Why did you do that? Now in my, you know, 53-year-old brain, I could say because I was pissed off, right? Because I was devastated, because I was freaked out, right? But I didn't have those words, so I was just guilty, all right? So one of the things that happened to me as I grew up and I went through life and I was a suicidal youth and I tried to kill myself and landed in a psychiatric unit and then from there I came to Lawrence, Kansas and put myself into Alcoholics Anonymous. At the time I had been drinking my way through high school so it seemed appropriate that I end up in Alcoholics Anonymous. And I spent five years clean and sober in AA and it was again for me one of the best things that ever happened to me. It gave me a foundation of and tools that I still use. And there were people there, people that looked to me and saw something different than what I saw. Because all I could see was that I was somebody who was pissed. <laughs> that was somebody who like, didn't want people to be near me. And I had a story that if you got too close to me, you would die. So I was so blessed to find people like Sharon Dwyer. Sharon Dwyer and I go back to 35 years. Yeah. Sharon was somebody who served as a role of what they call a sponsor for me at times. If I would be freaked out about something, I could call Sharon. And Sharon lived on Kentucky Street in this cool apartment, in that cool brick building on Kentucky Street. And she had me come over and sit on her porch and uh, have a tea or a coffee and talk, right? And so Sharon taught me, and the people who served me then in those rooms taught me what I consider the key to peace now. And that is willingness. Willingness. Because what I know now is that all of us have stuff happen to us. Right? Eric Butterworth is one of our great leaders and teachers that I love very much. And Eric Butterworth says, things will happen around you. Things will happen to you. But the only thing that matters is what happens in you and within you. And so what I learned at the tender age of 18, 19, 20 was that 
I am, it starts here, <laughs> and I have to be willing to feel differently, to think differently, to move from where I am to a new place. And that tool of willingness has been with me my whole life. And I'm blessed to have been just in such an intense situation so early in my life that I, at the time, didn't feel like I had a choice <laughs> to do anything but get willing, right? And so when I got willing, I learned the serenity prayer. And the serenity prayer then, for me, was God grant me the serenity. And then, for me, God was out there still. God was, had to grant me that serenity. God had to grant me the courage, the wisdom to know the difference. Then I moved on through life, and other things happened. And some of those things were traumatic. I've had friends who've lost their lives because they're transgender people and they couldn't handle it. And so they killed themselves. And today is the anniversary of the death of my mom. And when she died in 2011, that year for me was a very intense year. That year started out with Jessica and I starting to, my birth year started out with Jessica and I working on becoming foster parents and going through that process. And then our dog died of 16 years, who was our baby. And then the next month I donated a kidney. And then a couple of months later we got Emmett into our lives and we were brand new parents and had no sleep. <laughs> and three months later my mom died. And 13 days after my mom died, Rose came into our lives. So we had two babies, <laughs> and we were, had a lot going on. I was grieving my mother, and then a month later, the cousin I donated the kidney to died. So, <laughs> right? It sounds like a bad country song, doesn't it? <laughs> it's like, who's going to live through that? Right? Well, I will tell you that it was a time in my life, much like when I was 18, when I could find no peace. <laughs> And yet, I had this willingness, right? I had a willingness because I knew that if I was willing, that I could find it, <laughs> that I would be able to find it. And once again, it came back to other people being able to be there for me to show me how to access it. And at that time, it was y'all. It was this community. And at that time, our reverend was, the reverend that we had here was way big on being still and finding peace in stillness. Now, y'all who know me know I don't stop moving much and I'm quick and I'm, I'm talking all the time. You want me to sit still? <laughs> and I had done meditation, my version of meditation before, and I'd learned that. It's like just repeat the serenity prayer over and over and over and over and over and over, and over again. And that worked for me. Right? But it wasn't working anymore. And the stuff that I'd done before wasn't working anymore. And so I had, but I was willing. And so I took the time to start being still. And I would practice, like, getting my body just as still as possible, which is usually when I realized that I had sleepy dirt in my eye. Because until that moment, I hadn't been still enough to even notice that I had sleepy dirt in my eye. <laughs> but I would get my body just as still, as still as possible. What I noticed is that when I'm being still, and I'm willing to be still, that I'm also in this moment. And what I noticed is that when I'm clear that I'm in this moment, in this now moment, there is peace. There is stillness. In my mind, there is peace. Most of the time, when I'm not peaceful, it's not happening at this, the things I'm imagining, the things I'm thinking about, are not happening in this moment. They're happening out there. Or they're happening in my fantasy about some scary thing I'm scaring myself for on purpose. That's called worry, by the way. <laughs> when you fantasize about scary things <laughs> that aren't really happening, <laughs> that's called worry. So when I'm worrying, I'm not in this moment. So the first piece was to be willing right, to get myself still now. I have been coaching people now for over 15 years. I've had my own business for over 15 years now. And I have been pushing meditation on people for the last, since I discovered it back in 2011, I've been 
spouting meditation and spouting being still to people. And I have people who have come to my seminars and who have read my book and who have done my work and still will not meditate and be still. There is something missing in their willingness. There's something about being stirred up <laughs> and having your mind on drama that really does have some juice in it sometimes, right? It could be juicy. It can feel good sometimes. And when you were raised in chaos like I was, chaos is normal. <laughs> so it's easy to roll around in chaos. It's easy. That's the easy way. But the willingness to be still, the willingness to just sit still for a bit. And when I did that, I discovered that there was this power within me. And I discovered that the phrase, there is a power within me that is greater than any circumstance before me, started to become real for me. Now, throughout, since that time, it's not like I've had a life without any sadness or without any horrible things happen. I mean, again, life happens. <laughs> stuff happens to me, stuff happens around me. But what I'm clear about is that what matters most is what happens within me. And that when I am willing, when I'm willing, I now have an avenue that can get me back to the serenity prayer that I know now. And for me, the serenity of the prayer that I know now because of new thought teachings, because I'm a truth student, because I'm here with unity, is that I am, I am the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. I am the courage to change the things I can. And I am the wisdom to know the difference. When I found that, when I got there, then for me there's no denying that peace is always within my grasp when I'm willing and ready to be still. How about you? Because, see, I've been somebody who has said the things to myself like, I am so tired of being angry because I've been angry. Not just angry, mad, like I'm getting mad at you because you did something to me, but like angry for months. <laughs> Carrying anger with me for months. I don't have to do that anymore. There's avenues out of it. I have been powerless. I've been in situations where I just have no ability to make it different. None. Powerless. And I have lived in fear that is so gripping that it makes me feel like I can't move. And all of those things for me are the opposite of peace. And yet all of those things are things that still get generated within me, just like peace does. And so learning to manage my mind, having the willingness to be still, and the knowing, and this is where I love this word knowing, because for me there's a big difference between what I believe and what I know. And now I have a knowing that peace is within my reach in this moment anytime I'm willing to get still, be in this moment, and affirm that it's mine. Namaste.